May we see the Buddha life after life, always hear the Lotus Sutra, world after world. Practice the Bodhisattva way without regressing and quickly realize uns unsurpassable awakening. May we not squander this precious opportunity to hear the Dharma so that the wondrous expounding of the Buddha vehicle will sink deep into our hearts. May we escape from the darkness of ignorance and slander of the Dharma and claim the enlightened, enlightened path of the one vehicle and true faith. May we bring this wondrous practice to, to its perfect fulfillment and let us attain the great benefit of quickly becoming Buddhas. Namu myo ho renge kyo. Namu myo ho renge kyo. Namu myo ho renge kyo. So today, uh, we're going to talk about the title for today's uh, talk was uh, Dharma Beats. So we're going to be talking about the Shusu, right? We all use this ones. Right, we all have these ones that are very, very cool. But uh, most people think that uh, shoes is just like uh, um, something cool that we wear or doesn't have much of a meaning, right? But actually, it's, it has a very interesting histo history and also um, there's a, a lot behind it. So we're going to delve into that. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. I hope. Uh, my intention is that we, everything we do is to deepen our faith, deepen our practice. You know, Sensei always write that uh, when he dedicates something to somebody, he always write deepen faith and practice, right? <laughs> so everything we do is always to deepen our faith and practice. And why do we deepen faith and practice? It is for us to achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, right? So behind everything we do, that's our goal always. I was saying that, you know, uh, we use, usually use the word jutsu, right? Which is like uh, the Japanese name for the beats. But uh, there's another word that, word that I like better, which is nenshu, which we're gonna see that is more closely associated with the actual uh, meaning of what the beats are. But there's a, uh, which am I called a uh, Sanskrit word for them, which is Japa Mala. Are you familiar with this word Japa Mala? I've heard it referenced one time, so yeah, just one time. Okay, good. So do you do you know what uh, Japa Mala means? A Japanese prayer beads? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. They can, they can be Japanese, they can be Chinese, they can be Tibetan in, from India. Uh, but uh, Japa Mala has an interesting meaning. So most of the time people call this uh, Mala, right? When they use the Sanskrit word. But Mala is actually no, not really accurate because the word Mala means garland. So the word mala, many people say, oh, I got a new malas, you know, that, that's actually just means like something like a necklace. So if you see this slide, you know, these are different styles of uh, Nichiren uh, prayer beads. So I would like to talk a little bit about this word uh, japa mala. Japa mala is actually a composite word. Shapa is the act of reciting mantras. So originally, you know, the idea of, uh, especially in the practice of sadhana, right? Is a, or maybe I have to explain something uh, about history before we get into, into this. So does anyone know where, when Buddhists started using beads?
Does it go back to yogic practices? Yeah, the yogis uh, use it too. Anyone has an idea? Where's the ori origin? Okay, so I guess no. So let's uh, let's explain a little bit about background. So this this part of the name Japamala Japa is uh, very important because Japa uh, is uh, the act of reciting mantras and sacred sacred words. <clears throat> so we don't know exactly when Buddhists started using Japamalas. We know that there. Uh, uh, we know that. Uh, they, they're used by a lot of religions that appear in India. And we know that Theravada Buddhists, <clears throat> they don't use it. And they don't appear in any part of the uh, Theravada canon, right? But they do appear in the Mahayana canon. So we believe that the Mahayanas, Mahayana Buddhists uh, adopted them. And uh, so we don't know for sure if it was a uh, Mahayana Buddhist started using it and everybody else started using it or other religions started using it and then Buddhists also adapt, uh, started using them as well. But the part that is important uh, because it talks about mantra is that uh, it is related to uh, Tantric Buddhism and uh, which am I called Mahayana? Because in Mahayana specifically, we use uh, mantras and sac sacred words. So the way that the beads were used was for counting, right? Counting the recitations. So every time you will recite, uh, you will you will count them. And uh, there was a uh, there was also. Uh, People think that it has to be aloud or in silence, but actually there's three different ways in which um, mantras and sacred words are recited. The first one is of course aloud, right? The second one is like a whisper. And the third one is mentally. So we know that, you know, it is, uh, uh, it was a custom to be able to count them. And they were usually uh, a guru or a teacher will give you a mantra to a disciple, right? To accomplish a certain level of sadhana. And, you know, the, the, the disciple has had to do this practice and recite this mantra. And something that is important, uh, you know, when we're talking about sadhana and mantras, uh, Usually they imply a deity like a bodhisattva, right? Or even like a, a wrathful deity or any deity. So they go in different levels. So for instance, you know, one sadhana could have been, you know, reciting the name of Avalokiteshvara. So maybe you have to recite the name of Avalokiteshvara 3000 times, right? To accomplish that sadhana. So the way that they will do it will be that they will, they need to keep track of this. So how will we'll do, they will do it every time they recite the name, you know, they will count one bit. And then, you know, most bits have 108 bits, but they have also this on the side. And people think that this is actually uh, like, uh, something of Japanese Buddhism only. But if you look at Tibetan and um, also Chinese beads also have this on the sides. And usually these ones on the sides were for you to count uh, revolutions, right? So you will count one way and the other way, and then you will have 108. And then you will move one of these ones to know that you completed one revolution. So that's 108. 
So you will do it again, and then you know that you have 216. And then you move it, you complete another revolution, and you will know that three revolutions is around 320 something. So that's, that's the way that they were using. And when they completed whatever the master or guru told them to do, they will know that they have completed the practice and, you know, and reach it, their goal. If they, if they didn't reach their goal, that, uh, which is my goal, uh, they will have to do it again. So, uh, something about, uh, esoteric Buddhism and tantric Buddhism is, uh, that, you know, uh, mantra is something really powerful, right? In Nichiren Buddhism, we use mantra. We believe that the most powerful mantra of them all is Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, right? And Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, what is, what is it? The Dharma, right? So, uh, something from, uh, Tantric and Esoteric Buddhism is that a mantra is equal to the deity. So each deity has some, has a particular mantra. And that mantra is the same as the deity. Now, for us as Nichiren Buddhism, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is not a deity, but is the law, right? It's the actual Dharma. So the same principle applies. So we see that, you know, because of the name Hapamala, you know, these were really, uh, are really something that are Mahayana. Actually, there's only one region uh, on the Theravada world where you will see uh, monks using prayer beads. And that's on, uh, um, what's the name of uh in Burma you have to go to Burma to see monks uh Buddhist monks using uh, Hapamala but in Mahayana Buddhism this is something very 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 common so we don't know exactly when it started but because of the name we know that it's related to uh Mantrayana practice up there up until there, are you following me? Did I bore you already and put you to sleep? Oh, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's very good. Okay, good. So that's the word Hapa, right? So uh, actually Hapa, we can split it into two. So Hapa means to order in a low voice or repeat internally or to mutter. Uh, ha can also mean to destroy beard and dead and, and rebirth. And pa meaning to destroy one's sins. So um, Westerners, we don't like the idea of destroying one's sins, but also just to destroy one's sins as to destroy one's negative karma, right? And uh, at the same, at the same uh, time, you know, the idea of uh, uh, ja meaning uh, uh, to destroy beard and death and rebirth. This is very similar to the idea of uh, uh, this uh, eliminating the four sufferings, right? That we see in early Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism. So this is what, uh, what, uh, what I was talking about when, when I say that uh, uh, Shusu, uh, I didn't like that word that, that much. So in Japan, Chapamalas have a few different names. So actually, there's more names than these two. So usually in Michelin Shu, we call them Shusu or Oshusu. And then uh, your other schools may use and so some uh, some branches of Michelin Buddhism also use the word, nen word Nenju. So Nenju or O Nenju. So O at the beginning is a uh, uh, honorific uh, kind of uh, uh, word, you know, like the go in go honson, right? So we put o at the beginning, like when we say o daimoku. So that's that kind of means that you know it's uh, special in a religious way. 
So, juice means a counting beads. So, beads that we use for counting, right? Now, ninja, uh, I like better because it means uh, dot beads, you know, beads of dot. And I like this one because uh, there's actually one sutra uh, in, within the Mahayana canon in which talks about uh, how uh, Shusu started. So this, the story goes that there was a king uh, from a small kingdom in India. And because his uh, kingdom was small and was uh, surrendered by all these other countries, uh, it was always constantly under attack. So the king was always preoccupied, right? Because when he would put down one fire, another fire would start another border, you know, like always uh, the other kingdoms trying to invade or attack. So he was always so preoccupied and he was a devout Buddhist, but because he was so busy trying to take care of uh, his uh, kingdom, uh, he was not able to practice that much. So he decided to ask the Buddha. One time the Buddha went to visit him and he asked the Buddha, how can he have tranquility to be able to practice while, you know, with all this situation on his kingdom? And the Buddha told him, you know, that he should take uh, 108 bits and make a loop with them, right? and that every step that he took she, he should be mindful of the three treasures the buddha the sangha and the dharma so every time he will recall the buddha the, Sarm, the dharma and the sangha he will move one bead on on this mala and he will do that all the time so at every moment you know he was practicing mindfulness and as a result, his mind was calm. And because his mind was calm and he was virtuous, you know, his kingdom became peaceful. So you can see the relationship between mindfulness and, and the beats. And you can see also why I like the name Nenju better than Jusu. You know, because Nenju means uh, those beats. So usually, uh, uh, when you walk around with your juice, you know, you hold it on your left hand side and your left hand and you, uh, every time you take a step, you move one of the bits. You, we can see this also in other religions, uh, you know, Muslims do this too, you know, as, as they walk like a kind of a mindfulness practice. Uh, of course, they know mindful, they're not mindful of the three treasures. They mindful of uh, Allah, uh, the, the true one God. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's interesting because actually Muslims started using beads when they invaded India and they saw, you know, Buddhists uh, using beads and they adopted them. And then uh, later when, you know, the Christians during the Crusades uh, saw the Muslims using these beads, the Christians created a rosary. So the rosary that you see Christians using is actually has the same origin in India as the Jusu that we use in our school. Isn't that interesting how everything is interconnected? For sure that it is. is, thanks. That is very, very cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the history of that. That's really cool. Awesome. So if you look at this picture, I choose this, you, you may say, Kantoko, these are not, you know, Nichiren style Jusu, but I wanted to show you some Jusus from, another, from other schools. So the one that you see on your left hand side, this is from uh, the Pureland school. So they use a ring actually to, to, count, to count the beads. This one in the center, this is uh, from the Pureland school. And actually, these are very similar to the ones that Nietzsche and Shonin used and the Nietzsche and 
uh, practitioners use it to use. It's a very, very similar. Just a little, uh, the ones that we use it or the Nietzsche and Shonin use it were a little bit different. And then on your right, this one that you see, this is from the Tendai school. And actually this one, the, if you look at it, you know, it have like this, uh, this bit that are kind of flat. So this, this is a later development. Uh, they used to be all rounded like any other uh, prayer bits. But uh, over time, they changed them into these flattened ones, you know, so they only actually have uh, the round ones on the counting side. All other ones are flat. And there's actually a sutra that says that um, Shusu shouldn't have a uh, flattened, uh, which am I called, bits. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> this is actually bad, according to this one, one sutra. Uh, uh, ideally, they should be rounded. So we talk about this, uh, the origins, right? It is believed that Shapamalas may predate Buddhism, but they were widely used by the religious traditions that sprung in India and those that were contemporary to Buddhism. While in India, it was common to deities to be presented wearing malas, garlands. In the next, it was uh, in Buddhist art in China, when malas began to appear being held by bodhisattvas in hands, usually in the, in the left hand. The king, uh, the, the name of this king that appears on the sutra uh, was uh, Vaidonya, right? So now let's go into the meaning of uh, Shusu or uh, Habamala in Nietzsche and Bolson. So before we um, move on to this topic, I wanted to ask you, do you have any questions? You you might get to this kantoku, um, but I'm wondering uh, in Nietzsche and Buddhism when the trend started getting away from using the juzu for the counting um, aspect of it. Oh, we still use it for counting. Okay. Yeah, we we still use it. the The reason why it's less popular to count it nowadays is because there was many ways to count before. Like for instance, uh, when people would sit down to practice, remember we didn't have clocks before, right? Yeah. So, so people, uh, it was difficult, you know, incense was expensive, right? So one thing that they used to, there were many ways that they used, they used it to count time, right? But some of the ways uh, was expensive. Uh, because, uh, for instance, in China, they will use uh, incense sticks to count the time of practice, right? Because there were no clocks available, so they will use a stick as a as a as a clock, you know, the time. Or they will use powder incense and put it. And actually, we still have this in Nietzsche and Buddhism. If you go to some temples today, they put the incense in a burner which looks like a box and it's a uh, um, the the incense is powder incense that is placed in a particular figure right so it is lightened in one of the in one of the ends and it starts burning and uh, you get the per, the person can see it from far you know as long as it burns when it stops burning you know that uh, practice lasted for an hour so that was another way but uh, incense was not always uh, available, right? So that was complicated. So there was another way, which was with water. You know, they will uh, fill up a recipient with water that will uh, um, leak drops of water, you know, and you will know uh, when was on, when the the water is stopped dropping. So they used to, but the most practical way was, you know, counting. 
with with the malas. So even if you didn't have an instance of, if you run out of instance, and especially if you're counting how many recitations, you know, if you want to know exactly how many recitations you're doing, the best way is to do it with the with the shuso. Nowadays we have clocks, so we usually say, "Well, I'm gonna sit down and chant 20 minutes," or you know, uh, "I'm gonna chant and sit uh, uh, and sit for an hour," you know, something like that. So the reason why uh, they stop it, uh, kind of, uh, even though we still use it because sometimes uh, we wanna know, you know, how many were, how many of the mogul were residing, right? Because uh, when you do it by time, you only get uh, an approximation, and how fast I chant may be different from how fast you chant. So it's never an hour. It's not. It's not always the same. It doesn't mean that you recited the same amount of all moko. So in each and in each and both, and we'll still use the malas for counting. So and I'm gonna explain how how we use it, how we use it for that. But uh, one of the reasons why uh, it became more uh, a lot of people don't use them that way is because nowadays we have clocks to measure the time of practice uh, that we use. And also uh, even in the old way, you know, using incense to count the time you're practicing, I found it distracting for, at least for me, you know, because I have to be looking, you know, uh, you know, at the incense and, uh, you know, you may uh, just uh, be so focused on your practice that like you're not paying attention to the smoke of the incense. You know, you may not notice when the incense uh, finish uh, burning. You know, you may, you may just keep going along. That, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about the meaning of uh, Shuso in Nietzsche and Bosom. So you probably know this. Uh, the main loop is made of 108 uh, bits, right? And uh, this 108 bits, there is some, um, uh, which am I call? Sometimes it can be different. There's smaller ones, it's, or there's bigger ones too. There's uh, some bits that have 1080, right? Or some bits that have uh, 54. Right, and even there's some that has a uh, 54, 25, 27. So there are bits that have 27, but if you pay attention, there's always more, a multiple of 108. So 108, this actually comes from the Buddha's teaching. He says that there's a uh, 108 sufferings, defilements, pleasures, or early desires. And there's a way to uh, calculate this, but uh, it's related. Well, there's a few explanations, but the um, the way that they're explaining how you get to 108 is uh, if you look at you know uh, the different uh, you know you have six sense organs right that perceive everything that you can perceive, and then you multiply that for the type of reaction that you may have to those things that you preserve. And you may think, Kantoku, how is it six sense organs if we have only five senses? But in Buddhism, the mind is a sense organ as well. Because think about it, when you imagine in something, you can see it, touch it, and perceive it without it existing. It only exists on your mind, right? So the mind by itself is able to perceive it perceives objects of the mind so that's why in Buddhism the mind is considered another sense organ so there's six sense organs and for everything that we perceive we can have three different reactions which is pleasant unpleasant and the third one is neutral so whatever we experience you know we may like it we may not like it or we may just don't care, you know, we <laughs> were indifferent to it. So we have those three. So you multiply 
the six organs by the three different reactions that you may have. And then that number, you multiply it by when can you experience it? You can experience it in the past and present and future. And that's how you get to 108. There's other ways to do that calculation too, but this is the main idea. And the main idea is that, you know, these uh, experiences that we have, you know, what the Buddha says is that in the uh, first noble truth is that there is dukkha, right? There is a uh, insatisfaction with the, with our experience, right? So this is what this one hundred and eight represent. We're okay until there. So now within one hundred and eight, if you stop and you stay start counting, you're gonna tell me, Kantoku, you're wrong. There's no one hundred and eight. There's actually more, there's 112. So yes, actually there's 112, but those extra four bits are actually smaller than the other ones. So these marker bits that we find, actually in most uh, schools of Buddhism, these represent the four heavenly kings. You know the four heavenly kings, right? They're represented in the mandala of Honson, right? They're on the third protectors. You know, they represent in the mandala of Honson on the four corners. They're the heavenly kings that protect the nation. And each one has a different area, right? And so there's a heavenly king on the north, another one on the west, east, and south. So they're protecting. But in Nietzsche and Buddhism, we identify these four bits with the four bodhisattvas that emerge from the earth. The, the four, actually, there's millions of bodhisattvas that emerge from the earth, but we identify them with the four leaders. And they're all, all of them, their name ends on practice. So one is superior practice, we have boundless practice, pure practice, and firmly established practice. So in Nietzsche and Buddhism, instead of representing the four heavenly kings, these are the four bodhisattvas of the earth. Then we have the two big ones. And actually, some people think that this is only happens uh, in uh, which am I call? Uh, Japanese Buddhism, that beads have these big ones. Uh, but actually, if you look at Chinese Buddhism, they also use these ones. And they're called uh, parent, parent bits, which are the bigger ones. And on Nietzsche and Buddhism, we identify these two as Shakyamuni Buddha and Taho Buddha. And if you wonder which one is uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, it's uh, this one over here. It's Shakyamuni Buddha, and this one is uh, Taho Buddha. Now, if we look at the way, so uh, Seamos was asking about how we use them to count, right? So we will take them like this, left hand, sorry. We will take them like this, and we will go namo myo ho denge kyo 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 namo myo ho denge kyo. And so on until we get up to here. And uh, something that we do, you know, most people will think, okay, so when I get to this one, I skip the big one, you know, the parent bit, and I go to the next one. Actually, we don't do that because these bits represent the Buddha. So we never want to uh, jump over the Buddha. So now you can see me? Okay. So usually when we use the bits, for counting chanting, right? We do namo myo ho denge kyo 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 until we get all the way to here. Now, when you get to this, to the big one, most people think that you just follow along, right? But actually we don't do that. We don't go over this one because this is a Buddha and we don't wanna disrespect the Buddha. Right? Actually, in Tibetan Buddhism, they do the same thing. 
So when you get to this one, you start going backwards. Namo myo ho denge jo, namo myo ho denge jo, namo myo ho denge jo, namo myo ho denge jo. Until you get back to where you started. And there you know that you completed 108. And then you go here. And when you complete, oh, let me see, okay, there. Then when you complete one loop, you move one of these ones. And then with this one, what you do is that you know how many loops you have completed. Because if you look at this one, this one has this here, this is a uh, called a uh, dew drop bit. I don't know if you can see it there. The dew drop bit is different, right? But this one, doesn't have a dewdrop bit. So these ones are for counting revolutions. So every time you complete a revolution, you move one. And uh, if you do them all, you know that you chant in 1080 because there's 10 here. So every time you complete one. But the point is, we start here, we get to here, and when we get to here, I'm sorry, when you get to here, you start backwards. Is that okay? Does yeah. that make sense? Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you for explaining that. Not a problem. Uh, okay, so let's go back to sharing uh, screen. Okay, so we saw what the four small ones means. We saw the two big, two big ones represent Shakyamuni Buddha and uh, Taho Buddha, mini treasures. Now, if you pay attention, there was, there's a, on top of this uh, pattern bead, we have a long bead, right? So this one represents a Vimalikirti or Maitreya. So this one is by itself up here. And as you know, Vimali, Bodhisattva Vimalikirti, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Vimalikirti. And then uh, uh, we have uh, Maitreya, which is, a, of course, Maitreya. Maitreya is a future Buddha, right? So he's the next one to get inside the, the loop. That's why he is here. And uh, Kanse Hoshi was telling me that this one actually uh, if, your, if your beads break and you need to replace one of the beads, you can use this one over here. So it's like a replacement <laughs> kind of bead. So that's uh, very interesting. Now, if you look at this, you have 30 beads here, right? These 30 beads represents the uh, disciples, Ravakas of Shakyamuni Buddha. So that's, that's what uh, this means. And actually, the counter bits, that one, that, that, that string that it has only 10 bits and it doesn't have a dew drip at the end, dew drop, I'm sorry, it doesn't have a dew drop at the, at the end. Uh, that's the latest addition to our prayer bits. Originally, our prayer bits didn't have that one the counter was. So uh, at the, in, in the ends, they only had like uh, uh, four, four strings coming out only. So we used to have only the 30 Stravakas here. So the four two drops this represents the merits that emerge from spiritual practice and cultivation, right? 
So many times it is say that uh, these are were uh, our um, merits go. This represents our the merits of our practice. Okay, and this one is the one that I was mentioning that this is the latest addition to our prayer bits. So the 10 counter bits do not have a meaning per se. They are the most recently part added to the Shusu in Nichiren and Buddhism. They are used to count the loops that we chant. Any questions, guys? I just have a, I have a pragmatic question. So when you're counting with one hand on the beads going back and forth, is there a specific, uh, protocol for like etiquette on um, what you're doing with the other hand? Are you like, in a, is it just to your side? Is it holding the beads? Is it in a half kind of a, a gasho? No, the problem with gasho, usually when we're chanting for prolonged time, uh, we don't keep the hands in gasho because what happens is that your your hands will be become uh, numb, right? Mm -hmm. Uncomfortable. You start get feeling pain, right? So usually when we're chanting for a prolonged time, uh, what we do is that we uh, let our let our hands rest on our laps. So usually when you're counting with the beats, you will be sitting in Seisa, right? With your hands uh, on your lap and with one uh, moving the beats and the other one holding the counting beats, which is a string that has a 10. So one, one, uh, I'm gonna have to let me. I'm gonna show you when I finish with a with a with a with a PowerPoint, so that we don't have to go back and forth between the screens again. But I'm gonna show you how to how how you can do it. Is that okay? Great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Okay, this is a, this is a, I stole some pictures from, I think this is a, this hands belong to Sensei Ryuwei. I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think these are his hands. So we're reciting, this is a, how we use it during practice, right? So this is usually how we use when we're doing service and we're using the Sutra book. Uh, this is how, uh, how we hold the Shusu. And we do the we do it that, that way because it's the most comfortable way uh, to handle the bo books while we're practicing, because otherwise the juice will be all over the all over the place. Then when chanting the Odaimoku, right? We usually put hands in gasho, and this is how we we hold it. Now. Uh, have you noticed that in each and show we hold the uh, beads not completely close to the uh, hands, right? No, not close to the palm, but close to the tip of the finger. And uh, the reason why we do that, uh, Kansai Hoshi has a really cool explanation, is that when we put our hands in gasho, right? The big piece represent Shakyamuni Buddha and Taho Buddha. And or Hasengasho are like the stoop of treasures. So that's a, in some way, that's like a Gohonson, mm -hmm. right? So we're representing the Gohonson with our Hasengasho and holding the beads. That makes a form of a Gohonson. And it's telling us that the Gohonson is within us. So that's something really cool to know. If somebody explains, you ask you, you know, why do you feel, why do you place um, your the bits towards the tip of the fingers? You can you can share that explanation with them. It's a really cool. And then during meditation or a position that it, usually the priest uses this position called shasha, uh, we hold the bits here 
on our wrist? Uh, the reason is the bead with the two tassels. This is Shakyamuni Buddha. Because the four Bodhisattva beads are this side. And then this is uh, Many Treasures Buddha. So when we put the side with three on the left, the side with two on the right, it means Shakyamuni Buddha is on my right and Many Treasures is on my left. But when you look at me, well, not me, but when you look at somebody with this Juzu, you see the Gohonzon. Because when you look at the Gohonzon, Shakyamuni is on the left. Uh, on the right. So let's conclude our meeting for today. Uh, let's put our hands in Gansho and recite the prayer to, to end the study. What we think and what we say become the seeds of rebirth. What we do and what we touch becomes the karma of birth and death. Whether joyful or sad, the accumulation of the dust of our defilements and ignorance become a hindrance to the light of our heart. When we're confused, we're called ordinary, worldly people. But when we're awakened, we are called Buddhas. If so, we can restore the light of the mirror of our minds when we remove the clouds of defilements and ignorance. We will then have the same body of joyful reward as the Buddhas of the three times. We should have no doubt that we can achieve the tranquil joy of the Buddha way. Day or night, we must not slacken in our effort, but endeavor all the more to attain the way. But having faith in the Sutra of the Lotus Flower of the Wonderful Dharma, we open the mind of this very body becoming a Buddha. May the Dharma realm be equally benefited. Amu myo ho den ye kyo. Amu myo ho den ye kyo. Amu myo ho den ye kyo. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to get together. I appreciate you all, and I wish you a wonderful day. Please take care.